This is Mike Elkin, and you're listening to The Soul of Life, and are you lucky to be doing that? It shows your good judgment. Hey, before we dive into this great episode with Angela and talk about her awesome new book, Jailbreak, about the psychological prisons that we build, or life builds for us, I have to confess that in two years of making this show, more than 70 episodes, I've never asked anybody for any financial support to do it. Sometimes I'm a slow learner, but now I realize I need help to keep this going. Would you please become a financial supporter of the soul of life? If this brings you clarity, meaning, and in some way helps you or touches you, go to patreon.com forward slash soul of life show, all one word. Thank you. We are inherently good. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak with Dr. Angela Hubner, author of Jailbreak, The Making and Breaking of Our Invisible Prisons, an IFS Informed Escape. We're both divine and human, half human, half divine, and divine gives us the creativity and the all, all of the ways to complete our purpose, and the human gets on board to make it happen. Angela and I were peers in our level one training more than a decade ago. She describes this beautiful model of natural multiplicity of the mind for us. We can't change a neural pathway or a, um, a patterned behavior until we can connect with it. And she describes just how different IFS is from conventional psychology like cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT is great for some things, but it overrides rather than pulling together. IFS is much more a quicker transformation in terms of change. Angela talks about the most common protective parts of us, what she calls our prison guards. The pleaser, the perfectionist, um, I talk about the worry wart, the critic, and the logician. She talks about heart math and life force yoga, techniques that she uses to bring a somatic focus to her IFS work. And Angela leads us through an awesome, magical, and hypnotic meditation that she calls scuba sitting. I grew up on a lake, so I love swimming. I love being in the water. And for me, being underwater is a really calm place to be. Welcome to the Soul of Life. I'm Keith Miller, and this is episode nine of season four, Jailbreak, Getting Out of Our Mental Prisons. It's left brain. It is what our Western culture worships. Be logical, be rational, don't be emotional, be able to back up your argument, see the next step. There was no definition of the mind that anybody had. I'm Keith Miller. That's really weird. Can we swear on this? Something you hear at a swing party. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds that's... fun. We don't treat trauma. We treat the imprint of traumatic experience. I stood on top of the Olympic podium, very incomplete, not happy, and never ever thinking that I was good enough. Donald watched the older brother be destroyed that way. So he had to exile all the sensitive parts of him. Free soloing is climbing without ropes. Alex was born for climbing. Cannabis use disorder is real. There's no question about it. The, the broccoli growers of America are livid every time that they listen to this part of your podcast. What happens before sex? What happens during sex? What happens after sex? Compassion is contagious. We've got to have cake. Oh my God, I totally am bisexual and that's where I gotta be. He's incredibly successful by just talking shit about people's fried rice. This is the soul of life. Hey, it's Keith Miller. I just want you to know that I've created a bunch of inexpensive and free courses on marriage improvement, mindfulness, and stress reduction. Just head on over to souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses and check out the cool resources there. Again, that's souloflifeshow.com forward slash courses. What if I could show you a way to reconnect with the whole of who you are in service to your highest purpose as you know it? What if I could help you break out of the invisible prison in which you've been living, the one that keeps you small and scared? My guest today 
wrote these words. Her name is Dr. Angela Hubner. She's been a professor of marriage and family science at Virginia Tech for more than 17 years. She's a family therapist, an individual therapist, and um, a mental health professional, researcher, and a clinician. I'm really privileged to speak with her today about her book, Jailbreak, The Making and Breaking of Our Invisible Prisons, an IFS Informed Escape. Dr. Angela Hubner, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks. How are you? Doing really good. It's great to have you on on the soul of life. And more importantly, just to connect with you again, we trained together a long time ago back in the first level one here in DC. Like Exactly. Long time. Maybe 2008? I don't know, 2007? I have to go yeah. back and look, but yeah. 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 So it's great to see, it's great to see where you've landed now as well after all these years. Right. Uh, yeah. IFS is still a really big part of my world and I know it is for you. And a lot of people listening to this will be pleased with that because it is, um, as you know, growing and growing and growing in popularity. And <laughs> people are hungry for learning and training, which is such a great thing. So. Absolutely. When I yeah. Heard about your book. I said, Oh, wow. That's just another great resource. And when I started diving into it, I really found it's, it's very readable and easy to access and relatable. So I wanted to start off and ask you about that. You, you open up your book, Jailbreak, by talking about your own insecurity, I guess. Um, what was that like? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, to, to back up a little bit, um, I've wanted to write a book for a very long time, but felt constrained by a bit by academia, um, double, double edged sword, because I wanted to be able to use my voice and some of my experiences and turn the science into something that my clients understand, my students understood, um, and to make it relatable. So that, that's in part why I started with my story. Um, because I think, especially in IFS, we don't see ourselves as the expert, but more as the guide. Um, and so I think for me being honest about not all of my journey, but right pieces, pieces that I've worked through, um, I think helps the reader recognize that this isn't, uh, this is, this is normal, right? This is something that we all have to work through. Yeah. 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 That, that makes me, you know, just underscore how relatable it is, but how, um, germane it is or or how in the family it is your writing style really seems to you know when i when i read it and i hear it and then i know you or think of who you are and who as i got to know you in that in that training years ago you know how ifs is this extension of that you know i'm a trained social worker and so it's always been native for me to sort of be curious and just sort of roll up my sleeves and see what needs to happen um so it seems as though that's kind of a theme that comes through with IFS. We just kind of go with what's happening and let things unfold. Right, right. Well, and and for me, one of the reasons I also wanted to write the book was um, for so that people could understand what's the why behind all of our weird questions. Um, I did a podcast a while back with Tammy Sollenberg about that topic, the why under our crazy IFS questions. Um, and I, and I think when especially newer therapists coming out of level one understand what is the science that's underpinning the mechanism of change, um, it gives them much more confidence, I think, to work in the model. And it gives you a little more confidence to ask th- these questions when people say, why, you know, what do you mean multiplicity of mind? Or what do you mean? Where do I feel that? Or what do you mean? What does it look like? Right. Um, I think right. part of what I wanted to add to the, to the work was having a, an understanding of that. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me more about some of these weird questions and we should just give a little bit of an introduction. Maybe you can speak and just kind of give the elevator spiel, uh, elevator pitch of IFS, <laughs> internal family systems therapy for people who aren't familiar with it. Yeah. So, so IFS, uh, model developed by Dr. Richard Schwartz, um, assumes the three, three big assumptions. One is we all have multiplicity of mind, which means these parts of ourselves that, that talk to each other, the part that wants to listen to the podcast, the part that says, I don't know if this is going to be good, right? The, the, the back and forth is very, very normal. Um, and so it gives us a way to work with and get to know those various parts of ourselves. Um, another is that we are inherently good. 
um, and that we have something that IFS calls self, which is um, untarnished goodness, that, that this is the factory setting with which we came into the world. And it's our experiences and interaction that make us take on what IFS would call burdens or beliefs, ideas, behaviors um, that at one point in time were helpful, but may not be adaptive anymore. Um, so th- that's kind of the big picture. And then IFS gives a beautiful um, protocol for helping people to get to know these various parts, to access self, um, and to unburden the parts so that they can be more in flow. So even as I hear myself say that out loud, it's like, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> right. And so, so part of my, my goal in the book, um, was to help make that a little more concrete. Yeah. Um, one of the classes I taught in, um, at, at Virginia Tech when I was there was a combination of IFS and interpersonal neurobiology. Mm. Um, and I found doing that for multiple years helped me get the language into a form that my students could understand. Um, beginning students, beginning marriage and family therapy students, and then they could use with their clients. That's great. And so the book yeah. is, the book is really designed to be user friendly, easy to understand, a lot of humor because these are heavy topics. Yeah. These are heavy topics. And, and maybe we can, we can get into that a little bit. I'll just refer people to the episode I did with Dr. Dan Siegel, founder kind of of that field of interpersonal neurobiology. And that's one of the things I liked about how you were, your book weaves in personal narrative stories about, you know, how we get stuck, where, where we get hung up and how to understand what's going at a physical, a biological level, and then how to work with that. Because there's so many books, including, I'll, I'll just have to say, a lot of Dan's books, a lot of people who are very, very smart, um, you know, you're, you read it and you're like, or you know, one of my favorite authors to kind of pick on is uh, uh, Sapolsky. Um, his books are so uh, amazing. They've contributed so much to our field. But then I, I read them and I think, I can't give this to anybody to read. Like, it's helpful for me, background. Um, but when we get stuck, so let's just talk about that. Like, you, cause you're, the theme you're describing is jailbreak. So, you know, I imagine that relates to some people immediately hear that and they kind of think of their life as being stuck or imprisoned or, um, struggling. But then maybe another percentage of people, Angela might hear that and say, well, what do you mean? What jail? Yeah. So, so part of how I pitch it in the book that the chapters are set up by kind of understanding the foundation of how, um, how we develop and then how a jail cell might begin to develop. Mm. Um, and then how we continue to keep ourselves stuck. And so it is more in the, what are beliefs, thoughts, actions we take that continue to keep us stuck from being the fullness of who we want to be. It's almost like the cage door can be open, but we don't realize there's, there's a way out. Mm-hmm. So for so, me, the metaphor yeah. of a jail really made sense as yeah. I, as I was writing the book yeah. and and thinking about how I how I think about the work. Right. Talk about some of the patterns that that get us stuck. So so in the book, I pull in. Um, it, it it really starts with patterns of belief. That that's where it starts. So so one of the things I do in the book is talk about. Our attachment system is how we regulate our nervous system through interactions with the adults around us. Um, and so the patterns or ways that we can get stuck would be when those interactions, those attachments weren't secure, right? So, so more simply put, we will do whatever adaptation we need to do to stay connected to our group because we need that group, the family, to survive. And so if that means we have to increase our signal cry for connection or we have to shut it off, we'll learn how to do that all in an effort to keep us attached. Um, and, and later on in life, those same patterns can become maladaptive. In other words, they were helpful when we were kids, but not so right. much later on. And, and let me throw out an example and, and ask you to kind of play with it and, and kind of put it in your terms the way you just described that so nicely. So if if one of my early experiences is of a parent or a caregiver, could have been a sibling, um, that uses threat and intimidation in, in order to get their needs met, in order to um, stay balanced, right? In order for them to feel better. Mm-hmm. They resort to threat, mm-hmm. anger, sometimes violence. So then what kind of pattern is that going to possibly bring up for me? 
Yeah. So if I'm on the receiving end of that, then I'm more likely to either avoid conflict, uh, contact, like pull back, um, withdraw from interaction because it doesn't feel safe. Or I might uh, freeze, go, go silent, lose my voice. A third pattern might be really placating, really becoming hypervigilant to reading, are you about to get angry? Are your needs being met in a way so that I lose track of my own? So those are three different adaptations to how am I going to deal with with a relationship that's unpredictable and I'm not sure that I feel right. safe. Yeah. Those are just a couple of examples. And those are pretty typical examples for what we see um, in the in the consultation right. room. Yeah. And and then how do you um it, using IFS, what what is it that you have to offer when it relates to okay, you're you're this thank you, therapist Hubner. Um, you know, you pointed out that I've I've got these you call them ad- adaptations, right? So these behaviors. So uh yeah, I'm a pleaser. I know that. Um so what? <laughs> What do we do? Yeah. So this, yeah, this is where IFS, I think, is so brilliant because one of the things we know from um, reconsolidation theory, Bruce Ecker's work and, and others, is that we can't change a neural pathway or a, um, a patterned behavior until we can connect with it. And, mm. and so what does that mean? So IFS gives us a way to get curious, in this example, about the pleasing part of ourself from an open-hearted place, not from a critical, oh, you're so wishy-washy, I can't believe you don't have a backbone, you know, you can't stand up for yourself. IFS gives us a way to understand this pleasing part and how it came to do what it does. And that at the time, that was probably the best um, course of action for it, right? So if I'm a kid, I can't tell my parents to, you know, go jump off a cliff. Um, and stay alive, right? Um, but I can placate. Like that's a much smarter move for a kid with no power. Or I can go quiet, right? Cause then maybe you won't mm-hmm. see me. So those strategies, which probably literally saved the connection, saved you from abandonment, um, emotional, physical, or otherwise, um, were the right move then. And so even helping, helping clients develop that compassion for the strategy that their younger selves took on gives them the agency to change right. it. Okay. So you're, you're describing connection as a key to the, the change and the, and the transformation. And, and how is that different, Angela, than, um, you know, a lot of people are familiar with CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And a lot of people ask, I don't know about you, but they mm-hmm. come in to my office and our yeah. offices asking for, you know, I've heard about CBT. Do you offer CBT? How is this different? How is Mm -hmm. IFS different? So, so from my view, IFS is different because it pulls in the limbic system, the emotional part of the brain. It's not just trying to override protectors, which is what we would call, you know, thought stopping, changing the way you think. Oh, you think that just stop thinking that? That's my favorite. Um, Just, just stop thinking. It's much more. Right. Oh, just just stop stop it. it. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Stop it. Right. That's the Bobby Newhart skit. Um, so exactly. That's what I was thinking about. Um, I'll give you five dollars to stop it. If if people, if that were a, um, if that were a long term strategy, it would be great. People can get really good at white knuckling, Mm. um, change, but that makes it hard to be consistent and that makes it hard to actually change patterns versus overriding Mm. them. IFS lets us graft, essentially graft on to patterns that are already there to update them. We don't have to override them. We don't have to create a whole new set of connections. We're inputting new data into a road that's already Mm -hmm. there, so to speak. Um, So it's much more a quicker transformation in terms of change. So because we're using emotion um, we're really getting to know, for example, that pleasing part. What's it afraid of? What's it feel like when you're in that place? It's suggested that it's the emotion that comes with that when you feel the fear or you feel the sadness or the compassion that open that neural network and make it malleable so that we can add, okay, well, actually now I'm not eight, you know, I'm 55 and now I'm, I'm in a different right. place. And so then we can add the new data and right. it goes back. CBT doesn't, CBT is great for some things, but it doesn't allow that. It overrides rather than um, pulling right. together. Very cool. 
it imprisons. Maybe you, you, staying with a metaphor, it, it puts more. It makes more guards for the prison rather than let's heal the prisoner. Right. right. It put, um, so we don't need. Yeah. The guards. In, in in a certain sense, doesn't CBT really sort of um, put guards around the guards? Like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great way to say it. Makes, makes more, more guards. guards. Like yeah. um, you know, you can go get religion, or you can go, you know, get a a dogma somewhere. Um, I don't know if you're seeing this too, but activism, obviously, and over the last four years, has not that it's not that it's needed in our in our town and a a, a uh, mm. any encouragement. <laughs> it's always been alive and vibrant in our culture here around Washington D.C. But you know, activism has been has taken on a almost I want to say a sacred role in a lot of people's lives um almost a you know a, you know a, a mission a missionality if that's a word right and um we can we can go and get those energy sources but then you know the, often the question I'm asking and thinking of is is like well what are we doing with the thing that this is replacing what are we doing about the suffering the experience exactly. of loss or disappointment that that this activism is trying to fight against, which may be a good thing. Maybe we have to stand up to somebody who's causing harm, but how do we account for the whole thing? So, can you can you speak a little bit to um, you know you, you mentioned like the prison guards and, and talk about that metaphor? So, you know what what comes next in the process? How does it unfold? Because uh, when I talk to somebody like Kristen Neff, who uh, has mm-hmm done a lot of research mm-hmm. on self-compassion and the mindfulness community communities have known this for years like self-compassion can actually really be soothing and restorative but you know ifs has a little bit more of a i don't know how how you would describe it but it has it has more it has more so so first off i love the self all the self-compassion work that Kristen neff has done and i loved your interview with her as well i listened Thanks. to that um one one of the things, well, a, a difference is at least my take on on self compassion in that way is it, it's acceptance. It's sort of accepting everybody has this experience. You know, bring mindful awareness to it, um, and then be kind to it. And and that's that is lovely on on yeah, one it's aspect. Huge. It's beautiful. IFS, it's very huge. IFS goes another level to say, what if you didn't have to stay in that place Mm. anymore? Right? Because again, uh, when I think this is why the book is so helpful because it helps you understand the, the science behind some of the techniques that we're using. So for example, when we're going in to try to, I, I always say we're trying to heal the prisoner. Um, or another to switch metaphors just for a second, I'll say to my clients, we can make better band-aids or we can get yeah. the thorn out. Like, what do you want to yeah. do? We can keep putting band-aids on or we can get to it, get the thorn mm-hmm. out. Right. So, so similar, yeah. get to it. Right. So, so can we heal the prisoner? So the guards no longer have to do that mm-hmm. kind of work. And so part of how, how we do that is we go in there and we compassionately witness the suffering of whatever part is exiled, whatever part is imprisoned. And that's absolutely self-compassion work um, using some of those tools. The piece where IFS goes farther, though, is to is to do um, what Dick would call a, a redo, kind of what needed to happen. And this this is where I think IFS really pulls in the attachment piece, right? We're wounded in relationship and we heal in relationship, even if that relationship is is intrapersonal, me to me. There still has to be a relational component of that healing. And so often what happens in IFS is we ask the part what it needed to have had happen back then. Who, what did somebody need to say? What, who needed to advocate for you? And then we make that happen in the moment, right? Using often the adult self or even the therapist self to help go in there and have a, what we would call a corrective emotional experience. Right. That's changing the tenor of the memory in that network. It's not changing the memory. It's adding an update to the memory and it's changing the procedural memory attached to that. Right. And so what, what do I mean by that? Right. When, when we have that experience of I'm afraid of my caregiver or I'm monitoring a parent, you know, to see if they're going to be disappointed or angry, I have to please them, then I'm going to go into a particular set of behavioral responses, right? I'm going to placate, I'm going to please. Um, if I've done this update, 
now I recognize um, I don't have to do that in order to keep myself safe now. I can say, you know, um, I have every confidence you'll figure this out. I don't have to take care of this and not worry that I'm going to be abandoned. And that's huge, right? Because now we've taken what was in the past and pulled it into the present and updated it so that now wise self, adult self, um, can drive the bus, right? Can say, this is appropriate behavior for this, this isn't. This is a good way to think about it, or that's not. I, I tell my clients that I think the point of our work is giving them choice back, right? So they can accurately assess what's happening in real time and choose a response that's most helpful. Are, are you comfortable right now? now yeah. Right, real time. And are you comfortable with the, yeah. the word, this could get into some, a little bit of splitting hairs, but it could be interesting sure. for some people who are, who are really familiar with this, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with IFS, but they're also familiar with interpersonal neurobiology or just neurobiology in general. Um, cause I think it's an important sort of debate or discussion to have. Um, right. When you talk about the redo and this, um, question that you'll, propose and we propose to our clients what would what needed to happen then that didn't happen and are you comfortable with the word imagination there that that right i i yeah. am be yeah i am because because it's our visualization thinking about imagining right. what right. could be yeah and and may yeah. maybe that doesn't sound controversial but i remember dan siegel talking right like so oh, yeah, he yeah. was at he's at a conference with dick and they got up together and they're talking about this and you know, mm -hmm. and Dick was like, I'm sorry, Dan was very uh, clear about this. He's like, look, everybody, all, all of you IFS folks, can you please, like, if I want you to be mm -hmm. successful in, in, in the medical and in the scientific community. And if you're going to be successful, you have to stop talking about little beings inside of people. Um, we can talk <laughs> about the systems of the brain and how it may be turning on the right brain, so-called right brain and imaginative sort of parasympathetic nervous system, et cetera. And then, then it's unlocking, you know, some of the rigidity in the, you know, prefrontal cortex or whatever, but please like, let's just use scientific terms. <laughs> but then you have, you hear from Dick and I asked him point blank, Dick, are you willing to kind of give a little bit on this? He's like, no, I think they're real. They're actually spiritual beings inside there. So <laughs> where do you fall on that? Please take the time now to subscribe to The Soul of Life wherever you're listening. Give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. I, I agree on the, um, on the spiritual beings part. Mm. Um, even, even more so for me, um, I'm, I'm really, at this stage of, of the game, really more interested in the self-energy, divine intuition, um, the field, whatever you want to call that, that yeah. is, that is the seat of, of what should be running things. And so for me, having the, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, but being able to speak science and spirit has been really helpful for me with my clients because I don't care which way they think about it as right. long as it works for them. Right. Right. I, I can make sense of it and I can speak it both ways. Um, so if little, if, if these as, as internal personalities, you can't get your head around that. Okay. Let's talk about them sure. as files on the desktop. Okay. Right. Like whatever, whatever right. works. Ne um, neural patch. So, I have a client that says, um, I'm ready for my neural patch update, please. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. So, and that's, I think that's a mark of, of good therapy, right? To be able to adjust your language and thinking to what, what works for the client. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So I, cool. I've got no problem for me that that's how I think about it. And I'm really more, I, I'm really much more in the camp of we're both divine and human, half human, half divine yeah. and divine gives us the creativity and the, all, all of the ways to complete our purpose and the human gets on board to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, you know, so we're blocking the signal to the divine Yeah, is what can happen. Well, I think it sounds really nice, Angela. I mean, I, they're just, it, there's, I want to say it, it feels like very humble the way you just described that because it's, it's sort of like, well, what works for you? Like language, it's sort of, sort of acknowledgement of, of the incompleteness of our language, right? Like, you know, you, you, you grab a hold of something and you say, it kind of feels like this. And I say, well, I kind of think it feels like this. And so we're going to come up with a new word for it. And, or we use both words. We use two words or something. So that's cool. Um, couple of the, uh, terms that you use to describe these 
manager parts, right? Which are the, you know, for people new to IFS managers are parts of us that like to think ahead, um, don't like surprises. They like to get results and they protect us from uh, potential pain, emotional pain or disappointment. And so you have, you go into some detail about these guards. Who, who are the guards? Well, right. So, so in the book, I just tried to give some as examples because clearly everybody's going to have a, a different, uh, different guards, but those tend to be the, the regulars, if you will, yeah. um, that, that show up for most people. So the managers that I talk about in the book are the pleaser, the perfectionist. Um, I talk about the worry wart, the critic and the logician. Um, love that. And so, yeah. So, and if you think about it, those are kind of all different ways that we protect ourselves and, and stay, try to stay in connection with other mm-hmm. people. Yeah, tell me about the logician. We could talk about any of those, but I, that's, I, of that's, course. A, that's a cool way of describing that. But yeah. So, so the logician, um, the way I describe it is the analyzer, the one that tries to make sense of everything. And, um, in my family, that was that I, I thought logic was self mm. for a very, very long time. And in my in my first IFS training, um, my home wor- room person said, "Well, Angela, that's just another part." Mm. And like in that moment, my <laughs> mind was completely because I just thought that's who I was, yeah. right? So, so a logician um, is left brain. It is what our Western culture. Um, worships, right? Mm. Be logical, be rational, don't be emotional, be able to back up your arguments, um, see the next step. Um, and, and the logician is a lot of what I see in my office, um, Northern Virginia, lots of, of lawyers, software, yeah. politicians, you know, that kind of, that's, that's what rules the day. The, the, so the, that's, the that's coast. the logician <laughs> on the left coast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's the short version of of the logician, and is always trying to figure out and not be wrong and be able to back up what it's saying. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Um, let's shift gears a little bit, and, and, and you know, I think people sure. should dive into the book. They should go out and get the book and and read it if if they're going through something that's um, that feels, you know, like a struggle because there's so many tools that you offer in this book that help you reframe and visualize, like you said, like reimagine what could be going on. And I think we need those tools. We need, we need spiritual tools, right? We've kind of lost our, I'm kind of fond of saying we have lost our spiritual traditions in our, um, uh, you know, a collective sense of identity as a, as a whole. So your, your book offers a lot of those ways to, to tap into them and make them. And they're, they're not that hard, actually. They're, they're, it's like low hanging fruit, (laughs) you know? Um, Right. Right. Let's shift gears a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what it was like writing this book for you. You've taught many years and you, you mentioned like where you come from being, you know, the analyst or, you know, being the one that knows, right? So how was it writing this book? Um, for me, it, it brought together all the things I'm passionate about, which included, um, more of the woo woo, so to speak, right? So, so there's a whole chapter on, on self that, that I pull in what's the science around the heart. Mm. But, but I also pull in, um, parts of in, intuition. So one of my other teachers is, her name is Sonia Choquette and she is, she teaches a lot about intuition, which she calls our sixth sense, which I think mm. is self energy. Mm-hmm. Um, right? Everybody just sorts, sort of uses a different word. And so, Finding other ways to connect to that um, opens us up to be more uh, curious about our parts and have more knowing with the capital K as opposed to thinking. Like my logician can think and think and think and think. My myself knows. Like there is no m- many fewer words, <laughs> right? Like yeah. my my parts will talk 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 talk. Self is just like nope. Yeah, it's like this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So it's teaching, it's teaching people to feel the difference, right? What's the signature of a part versus what does it feel like when you're accessing self? Um, and so there's some examples of that. And, and if people play with these practices, you're going to, you're going to feel somatically the difference. Can you describe a little bit what some of the practices are? I'm glad you mentioned 
somatic experience, right? right? Our, our, you know, what we feel in our mm-hmm. body and, and how we know the truth, like in here. Yeah. Right. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how, you know, what are those practices? Well, so, so in the book, I have a few, there's, I do more in my office, but in, in the book, um, some come from the heart math Institute. So it's sort of bringing your attention to your heart space, um, imagining the breath coming in from that area um, and really feeling what that feels like in your body. Um, that's one. There are others that um, that come from life force yoga, which um, which is breath to manage moods. And I'm actually teaching at the Cape Cod Institute next week um, with Amy Weintraub this this how do you use your breath to manage mood, which translates into how do you access ventral vagal nervous system energy, which is self energy, kind of that felt state. So there's some breathing practices in the book um, that help people access that as well. So there's a mindfulness meditation practice, there's breath work, um, and there's kind of heart breathing to try to work on heart rate variability. Cool. I, I didn't yeah. I didn't prep you for this, but I, I really liked your your scuba sitting um, kind of takeaway, right? And I wonder if you would be willing to spend five minutes and, and ask people listening to this to, to you know pull over or whatever they're doing, but but you know press press pause and come back to this. And would you be willing to to lead something similar to like what you described in the book as the scuba sitting? Sure, of course, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so one of the things um, as as I'm talking about this, I have to I have to preface the scuba sitting by saying um, I grew up on a lake, um, and so I love swimming. I love being in the water. And for me, being underwater is a really calming place because it's sort of you can be under there and you can hear, but the noise is all up top, and it's just sort of a really calm place to be. So, so the invitation, if if you pulled over, if you want to soften your gaze or close your eyes um, and get comfortable, is just to imagine that you that you have dove down to the bottom of the ocean and you're magical so you can breathe this isn't a problem so just imagine relaxing into the buoyancy of the water holding you but you're able to sit on the bottom and just observe what's happening around you And there's just that calm. You might hear a slight buzz in your ears that's just calming. So as you're sitting in this spot, I want you to notice the different thoughts that come into your mind. And I want you to imagine each one of those thoughts as a particular sea creature or fish. And what I want you to notice for this part of the exercise is just naming the fish as it swims by. Right? So you might say, oh, there's my organizing part. It's, a, it's an orange fish that's swimming by. Okay, swam right by. And as you continue to sit, noticing another thought that comes by, maybe in the form of a shark thinking about somebody who did you wrong, an angry thought. And you notice the shark and you let it swim on by. And you might notice a blue fish that comes by with the thought of love for your family. And you notice that fish. And so for a few, a few minutes, just watch what floats by and let it go. Let it continue to swim.
And if you do this for a little while, you'll start to notice that the same schools of fish keep coming around. You'll also notice that you get to choose which fish you're going to grab onto and stay with or which ones you're going to let just swim right by. You get to choose which you're going to connect to. You might even notice that the same ones come round and round again, so you really won't miss it. It will be back. So as you notice the fish, breathe in and out through the area around your chest. And just feel the calmness and the water supporting you as you watch all of these different fish swim by. And when that starts to feel complete, you're going to bow to the fish. And you're going to push off up the bottom and break through the surface and come back to the space. Wow. How wonderful and, and soothing for me. That was Go amazing, ahead. Angela. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I could have stayed down there for a long time. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> really lovely. <laughs> right? And, and, and it, helps, it helps my clients do a couple of things. One is create the observer part, right? Me, there's, there's a bigger divine, whole, Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. Atman. You know, Dick uses all these different spiritual terms um, or the field, right? That is watching all of this unfold. And so it starts to help our clients get a... a I'm separate from these thoughts and we're connected. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when I have that differentiation, I can, from a calm place, really look at what is this fish and what does it want me to know? Mm -hmm. You know, what is this, what is this part trying to tell me mm -hmm. um, from that place? So yeah. I love that one. That's great. And where can people find you for people who have read your book? So you can, my, the best place is on my website, AngelaHebner.com. And spell that um, for people, the, Angela. The book is, a, um, yeah, it's A-N-G-E-L-A. -E and the last name is H-U-E, B as in boy, N-E-R.com. AngelaHebner.com. Thank you. Angela Hubner. Your book is called Jailbreak, The Making and Breaking of Our Invisible Prisons, an IFS-Informed Escape. So great speaking with you today. You as well. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, or get access to courses, and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrop. All right, I will go.